You see, in the film world, there's this thing called the box speed. A speed printed on a film box. It's all that it seems to be. Some shoot their films their whole lives at the box speed and live an incredibly awesome life. Some go further to read all this info on data sheets, which honestly look a lot like utter gibberish, never really bothering to understand them. Some take to forums and absolutely nerd out, doing tests for every batch of film that they shoot to come up with a bulletproof workflow for themselves. The aim then of me doing this video is to share with you a middle house approach as to how you can understand the concept of box speed, which is incredibly important if you want to make the most out of your film, but also allowing you to not really go overly technical and at least stay within the level of commitment that you wanted to make with film. Wherever you sit on that spectrum above, I assure you that you will find something useful. So without further ado, let's dive right into it. We are mostly going to look at black and white negative films for today because positives and also uh, colour can make it a bit more tricky to evaluate and even though the logic can apply, it's a bit less straightforward. I think based on the amount of public information that we have, it is the easiest to figure out for black and white as opposed to other genres where your perfect EI lies without having to do a series of elaborate testing just to figure out where how you should expose your film and so that would be the scope for our video today. I explained in greater detail in my earlier video on Ansel Adams that the same film stock could really mean a variety of film speeds to different photographers. For a couple of reasons I'll do a quick recap. For one, film speeds are generally measured using a variety of ways depending on the manufacturer. Second, the effect of film speed really depends on a bunch of things like gear and also how you handle your film in development. And three, the effect of film speed really depends on how dense you need your negatives to be. And finally, here we are arriving at the conclusion that the box speed is merely a statement by the manufacturer telling you what they think their film is and that absolutely has nothing to do with you. It's not something that you should take for granted. So following from that, here are five things that I personally do to figure out how I should meet to my film. The first and also the easiest thing to do is to check if they state the nominal ISO explicitly on their data sheets. This is most common for stocks which are made to be multi-speed films. For instance, Kodak 3200 being one of the most well-known ones that fall into this category. So on its data sheet, it explicitly spells out that the nominal speed is EI1000 when the film is processed in Kodak Professional TMX Developer or Kodak Professional TMX RS Developer and Replenisher or EI800 when it is processed in other Kodak Black and White Developers. It was determined in a manner published in ISO standards for ease in calculating exposure and for consistency with commonly used scale of film speed numbers, the nominal speed has been rounded to EI800. Okay, so that's really straightforward, I believe. That's going to be the case for most fast films, um, another one being the Ilford Delta 3200. They also have a similar paragraph along the same line, so if these are the films that you're considering shooting on, then read the datasheet. Another thing that I pay attention to when I'm reading the datasheet is how they have come up with these ISO values. I have a feeling that this mostly applies to Ilford because that's the only manufacturer that I've seen so far spell it out for you. So the way Ilford has decided to do it is that they won't explicitly spell out what an EI is for a particular film. Rather, they tell you that their speed measurements are based on a practical evaluation of film speed and it's not based on foot speed, as is the ISO standard. Okay, so here we come into this thing called foot speed. Basically, it's telling you the amount of light, the amount of exposure that you will need in order to create minimal usable density on your negative. So in practice, if you rate your film at the foot speed, you will end up with the thinnest usable negative that you can obtain on the film, which may or may not be ideal and that goes into another discussion. For what we are concerned here, we obviously cannot know what Ilford means by practical evaluation that's beyond what we could realistically know unless you work in Ilford. If you do, please shout because I would love to meet you. But to the very least, Ilford tells us that the film speeds that we read on their data sheets is more than just a negative that's the thinnest possible negative that you can obtain on that film. So while we don't know 
how Ilford has come up with the speed measurements exactly, but we do know is that it's not the foot speed and that it's more likely closer to the ideal EI that you would like to shoot on unless you particularly favour thin negatives. The third thing on this list, which is also fairly simple, is to look for the curves that show you the ISO in the data sheet. I personally think that this makes life so much more easier for photographers because our brains function in ISO terms more so than density, gamma, and a bunch of other things that sound more like Morse code to me. Let's take a look at Foma Pan's Classic 400 as an example. So these curves on a data sheet tell you the effective ISO that the film will achieve in a given developer in a given time. Now it seems that the film doesn't quite reach ISO 400 in most circumstances, despite it being called Classic 400. But at least you know what you can reasonably expect from the film based on these charts, and so you could correspondingly adjust your EI based on these information. On to the fourth thing, alert. This is gonna get a bit more technical, but bear with me. So the fourth thing is to look at the characteristic curves published in the data sheets. Usually film manufacturers include characteristic curves within the data sheets which plot the density against exposure, more precisely the log form of the exposure. It would typically look like an S-curve, but there will be quite a few within the same data sheet because the S-shape would vary depending on the developer and also the tank size. So what you do is to find a graph that corresponds to your developer of choice. The thing though with this approach is that you will need to do some interpolation and also you need to use your imagination for a little bit because we don't have the precise values based on these charts. All we have are course intervals that the manufacturer decides to publish and so this exercise is going to be an approximation at best. The point here is to get an idea of the ballpark of where you should rate your film at rather than getting the exact values because if that's what you want, I'm stressed, there's no shortcut to doing your own testing. But I think for the purposes of most people, having a ballpark approximation that's close enough is good for our purposes. So back to the curve. The section of the curve that we are really concerned with is the slope in the middle that's the straight part because that's where the range of the usable densities lie on a negative. Ideally, if you want to make the most out of a certain film, you would want to place the range of the brightnesses of your frame on this slope so that you can make the most out of this scale that the film has to offer. This is the first bit where imagination comes into play. You'll first have to figure out where that midpoint is on the straight part of this curve. So once you've done that, you then read the corresponding log exposure on the x-axis. This again will be an estimation because we only know that it falls somewhere between the intervals but we don't know where exactly, so you have to do an estimation for that. So now at this point you would have known how much exposure is required, despite in log terms, to produce the density level that's on the middle um, of what's possible on that film. So the only task that's left to do is to convert that amount of exposure into ISO or you know film speed terms from log term to film speed term. As I promised in the beginning, we are not going into too much technicality and so I figured this part out for you. So this is how you do the conversion. An easy to remember rule of thumb is that the EI is equal to 10 over the exposure. This refers to a zone 5 exposure, aka the middle ground, ideally, of the subjects that you're trying to shoot. That's the overall logic for it, and so let's start assigning some numbers based on the information we have about the Trix 400. Alright, so just to reiterate, this is a case of developing Trix with the TMX developer at 20 degrees with a small tank for 11 minutes. And based on the very rough estimation, we determined that the log exposure that would place our subject on the middle of the scale to be negative 1.3. So first, let's convert the exposure from log form into, well, its plain expression. So the exposure would be equal to 10 to the power negative 1.3, which would give us 0 0.05. We then convert the exposure into EI terms, aka 10 divided by 0 0.05 equals approximately 200. So in this particular scenario, I would rate my triax at EI 200. 
This while being a convenient way of obtaining a ballpark figure, there are obviously quite a few limitations that come with it. The first being the fact that there might not be a grab available for your particular choice of developer with that film. Usually you only get data for the more common developers. And another one being that it doesn't work if this x-axis is plotted based on relative log exposures, not log exposure. But that being said, even if all else fails, here's one more way that you could use to gauge the range of the effective EIs of that film, although it's the least reliable of all. That is, to read the recommended push-pull development times that's provided in the data sheet. So the logic behind this is that if the film manufacturer decides to publish something, it's probably because there is a certain demand for something. So you will get an idea just by looking at this chart, historically what people have been doing on this film. So for instance, let's take Roly RPX 400 as an example. Based on its data sheet from Roly, we see that it comes in a range of recommended development times for various ISOs, ranging from 200, so people have been shooting the Roly 400 film as if it were 200. And of course, obviously 400, that's the film at which the film is rated, up to 800, 1600, and all the way to 3200. So for instance, based on this information, if I know nothing about the film, I might decide to shoot it at like 250, maybe. It's not scientific at all, but it is somewhat helpful in the sense that it, it tells you what people have been doing with this film. There are of course going to be manufacturers who don't publish development times that are for EI slower than what the film is rated at, but most do. Personally, I mostly shoot film that come with a more complete set of information about the development times and also the curves and whatnot because these to me are integral bits of information that are critical in optimizing the quality of my negatives. The concept of film speed has way more to impact than its name tends to suggest. Just like how there are a thousand hamlets in a thousand people's eyes, there are a thousand box speeds in a thousand photographers' eyes. I hope that this video has been helpful and I look forward to your responses down below. Thanks so much for watching, I'll see you next Saturday. Bye!